I'm Megan Mitchell. This is my co-host, John Morrison, and you, yeah, you, <laughs> are listening to the True North Race Podcast. Time to strap in, pull those belts, and get ready for an action-packed episode of the True North Racing Podcast. Are you ready to unmask? Uh, I mean, unhelmet your favorite racers? Get ready for the most fun you'll have outside the racetrack to get you ready for the next race. You're listening to John Morrison and Megan Mitchell, and this is the True North Racing Podcast. Welcome back to a new week of the True North Racing Podcast, brought to you by Vision 20 Studios. I'm your host, John Morrison. Joining me, as always, is our amazing co-host, Megan Mitchell. Megan, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. It, I, I'm i not doing well because last week you left me hanging. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I do forgive you. Did you listen to my intros and outros last week? To be honest, no, I haven't That's, yet. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> it, you know how usually we go for about like 15, 20 minutes, just ca- like kind of catching up and going over our weekends? I was like 30 seconds. I th- start, I felt like I was starting to reiterate and repeat myself. Yeah. So, it was like a five-minute intro and a one-and-a-half-minute outro. Holy. But it's, it's good to have you back because now we can have our conversations. And I think... Uh, after what we heard and saw this weekend, I think it's a good indication of, you know, it's great that we're going to be able to have conversations conversations to talk about because sometimes we need a little bit of differing opinions. And this way, you know, with both of us, if I'm over here spewing what I think and it's wrong, it's good that you push back and say, you stand, you, you know, like, like last week when we were at the driver's night, you like, I and you just got in my face about. <laughs> I bet you didn't think I was gonna let that stay in, did you? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't even think you were recording. <laughs> That's why I oh left God, it in. It <laughs> I was like, "Nope, that is not happening." We're gonna have some fun here. Um, <laughs> no, it was eh. so. Now we got we get we have to recap with you for the last couple weeks here. Um, last week was me, the driver's night at Flamborough Speedway. How did you enjoy that? Having both your brother and your sister out there. And as well, it was the debut for your sister, Rachel, who got her first laps in a competitive field. Uh, let's, let's talk about it. How, how did the whole night go for you and your team? It was really good. Um, emotional. It was, to me, it was emotional and overwhelming to see my brother and sister on the track. And then to watch them do Meet the Driver's Night, it was just, it, it like pulled at my heartstrings to watch these little kids like so excited. So that was really cool. Um, My sister did really well. Like I tried stressing to her to just stay low, stay out of the way of, because like we know she's going to be off pace. It's her first time and she's nervous. So I told her like, just stay low. They will go around you. There's room up above you. So they did. And, like, she got a lot of good feedback, like, from a lot of the experienced drivers just telling her, like, you did amazing, like, really good job. Um, She thoroughly enjoyed it. Her first goal was to just finish a race, and she did. She finished both of them, so that was exciting. Chase did really well. In the first feature, I think we had, what was that, like, 24 peer stocks start. So the first one was kind of iffy. Yeah, like it. They were dropping like flies. So like to just make it through that without coming off the track was a win in my Absolutely. opinion that night. But he had a like a really good battle with Spencer Riddell. It was probably one of the most respectful battles that I've seen, but yet really intense. So that was really cool. Chase finished fifth. So it was overall a really good night. Yeah, I think it was uh it was really cool because it's it I it's not very often we do see like siblings go out there and race, but as well as 
to see your brother who after sitting for a year go out there and already competing for top fives mm-hmm. i think a little bit more work and he's going to be able to up, get up there and challenge in uh the top runners in the peer stocks i think so there was one night i was i think he was running third and i'm like just a few more laps he's going to be up there battling for the lead i think it was phil and spencer that was up there and i'm like i was certain he was going to do it but it got a little rough someone hit him he almost went into the wall and it kind of he lost momentum after that so yeah but like he's he does really well maintaining himself keeping composure he just he races really well really clean so like I don't think I've ever been so proud of my siblings <laughs> it sucks to just watch right now but well hopefully you guys you guys are almost trying to schedule yourself to have you out there this coming Saturday for and it is kids ride night at Flamborough mm-hmm. Speedway so that's going to be a great I I love kids ride night and I'm upset I'm not going to be there for it um it yeah. is probably one of my most favorite nights at Flamborough Speedway because I I I'm lucky enough that my drive driver I worked with a few years ago did not want to do it mm-hmm. and I'm like can I take it out then so it's the only time I can ever say at that point that I've ever been in a race car on a racetrack. Just it was driving some kids around the track, but it's 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 always so cool when they get in the car, and then you got one of the photographers standing there doing you know you're giving a thumbs up or giving those memories to those kids. It, yeah, it's really memorable. I still have a video on my Facebook. I think I would have been about. 13 or 14 and I got in line for kids ride night I hadn't raced the car yet but I wanted to really bad and and I got in line for it and there's a video like I sat there with my phone just kind of holding it steady videoing the whole trip around the track and at that point they were letting us do like multiple laps so it's like it was cool I don't remember who I was with I just remember them saying since you're older like do you want to go like the minimal pace or do you want to go a bit faster? I'm like, go as fast as you are allowed to go, please. So, you know, what's funny it's funny is I had someone say that to me one time. Really? And I know it wasn't you <laughs> because there's not that much of an age. There's only five years between us. I know it wasn't you. Yeah. Because I was, I was at least 25 at the time. So, no, it wasn't you. But yeah. it's a and same deal. I was like, how, you know, how fast do you want to go? Go as fast as you can. I sent that thing off in a turn one. (laughs) I was like, let's hope this sticks. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. It was a lot of fun though. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, anyways, so you're in the car ready. Uh, you guys did not make it out to Flambro's gold rush today, unfortunately, because you guys Mm -hmm. are trying to get your car, your car specifically ready to be out next weekend. How close are you guys able to? say this thing's race ready i think it's a good chance like we were hoping to be able to take it out for practice tuesday but that's not going to happen i could take it out no paint but take it out with no paint right i'm like by saturday we should be good yeah all right so definitely not too too far off um with with the gold rush running today, we're we're gonna get right into this. So with the gold rush running today, it was ten thousand dollars to win for the pro late models. We haven't seen a race like that with that big of a payout mm-hmm. in quite some time here in Ontario. And I'm gonna I would even when we get uh, our guests on tonight because we got a, a multiple guests. Uh, because we have the Southern Ontario dirt show joining us. We're going to talk to him as well about, you know, a high point, a high money, uh, high high money race. And they got a very, in my opinion, minimal car count. Yeah. Like do the guy, do you know, does this is the way I kind of want to look at it. Does no one want to race anymore because of the cost? or because they think the purse money isn't enough for them to go racing. 
do you, like does that make sense yeah so i've seen arguments on both sides all right let's hear let's push back against me here because i'm i'm for <laughs> why is why weren't there more cars to me i don't know i don't want to word it the wrong way and then get in trouble for it i'm trying to think of a, a right way to word it I think sometimes it comes down to, I don't want to say a lack of respect, but the excitement. Like, I think some drivers go in way over their heads. Okay. And they end up tearing up themselves or somebody else. So it's like, personally, like, we didn't go out today because there was a chance that one of the cars could get tore up. And then that takes away from time on finishing my car. So we're like, can't wreck it if it's at home. So we didn't go. <laughs> that's our reason. I mean, that's Just a good argument. Once, like, once the three cars are out, then you're more likely to see us because we were intending on going originally. Yep. But it's just after a lot of like debating and stuff. But I have seen a lot of pro late model drivers say that that it's just they didn't want to take the chance of getting wrecked. And not having, sometimes I think, like, I've seen them say, like, I can't afford to fix it. I don't think it comes down to money can't afford it. It's I don't have the time to do it Monday to Friday and have it ready for my next points race. Yeah. It's like, that's the only thing that sucks in the middle of the season. But, like, 10K to win, like, I'm on the fence about it because that's a lot of money. And I get what they're saying about the entry fee, how much it costs for tires, like, how much it costs to get there and back. But, like... I don't know. Okay, so here's here here's a here's a good question. So yesterday, uh, we saw that Jake shared. I don't know if it, it was on his schedule because they do have the pro late models, um, mm-hmm. up at Sobel Speedway. I don't know if he was gearing up for next weekend's APC series race up there. Uh, unfortunately, him and Ty Cavillan came together on the backstretch. I don't know the full story of what happened, so I'm not speculating. I don't I haven't seen video of it. Um. But looks like the two came together about at least halfway down the backstretch, and unfortunately Jake went up and flipped onto the up onto his lid. And of course, you never want to see that. But he was scheduled to come today to Flamborough Speedway, so was Ty. Yeah. Now, are we gonna say that? Well, those cars may have come together yesterday when they were there, or you know, like. It mm-hmm. kind of comes down to is is really is it even on a weekly night it could happen. Exactly. Your season could. I've seen guys. Hell, David Elliott. I I used to crew for him. Right, we went. Uh, myself and Ed, his crew chief, were heading up to Sunset. He was already up there, practicing the car. We got to probably we were about twenty minutes from the four hundred, so we were probably about another. 25 ish minutes to sunset speedway when we got a phone call we obviously did not want to hear hey i backed the car into the wall our season's done this was like august i think right. he, i think he was planning on going up there for velocity or something and he never touched that car till the off season like until after frosttoberfest he did not touch it so it, it I don't know what he, I can't, I can't remember, but it, it comes down to you have, if you win, that's, that's mm-hmm. a nice chunk of change. It is. But how come then when, uh, Jukasa was putting on a $50,000 to win race, we had big names coming up from the States to come run the race. Yeah. Like, if we want local short track racing to really succeed, we got to start supporting others. Like there's Mm -hmm. how many cars that were on the EPC series tour that could have came out. Yeah. Now, could they have wrecked the car a week before the Sable race? Absolutely. But if Delaware ran this weekend, he could have, they could have wrecked before going up to Sable. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it is cost. You got guys talk about it. Like, Shoot me a message. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Like what, what I'm saying wrong here. But I want to go over a couple Facebook posts that we saw today. 
So the first one is from Mike Mike Schmidt, who is a big supporter of Flamborough Speedway. He always helps and helps out as much as he can. Puts on, you know, he he's a a huge supporter and a huge advocate for Flamborough Speedway. Their races, he, you know, he's been the title sponsor of the London Recreational Racing One Hundred at Flamborough Speedway. I think since the inception of the APC Series Tour. He, Mike does so much. He goes up. They, he gets igloos made up uh, from from a gentleman up north mm-hmm. who builds them for us. Builds, I think, what? I don't know how many trophies, but he gets started on them early. I know that. Yeah, I think just, top just, three of each division. It's it, like we had three divisions. Now, I think it should have been a $500 to win pure stock race and maybe like a $1,000 to win. Or maybe there, it would have been nicer if there was a bigger card like I'm not yeah. saying mini stocks and pure stocks aren't or aren't, aren't, don't deserve of an invitational, but I think what needs to happen is that maybe like like next weekend, next Sunday at, at Sobble, there's a super stock invitational, mm. fifty four laps. I think I I have to go. I can't remember exactly what it is to win, but I think it's still a nice chunk of change. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, I want to get into what Mike said here. Mike so Mike goes, I want to thank the pro late model teams that came out to run the gold rush at Flambro. I also don't understand the lack of support from the remaining pro late model teams. It's beyond brutal. The track puts up a $40,000 purse and only 16 cars show up. Sad. Now, granted, Jake Sheridan was supposed to go. Understandable why he was not able to attend. Yeah. Uh, who else? Uh... Billy Zardo was supposed to go. Yeah. He broke last night as well. Mm-hmm. Again, there's if your car's just sitting at home up on jack stands and not supporting mm-hmm. a big money race like this, you'd rather go to the APC series and, and win three thousand dollars or have a chance at winning ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I mean, if you win the ten thousand dollars, it's it, it and it was a green to checker race. So yeah. See, and- <laughs> That's the thing I thought of. I'm like, it's it's hard to say. Like, you can you can kind of be nervous about it, I guess, and think that like it it could possibly end a disaster, which like Absolutely. any given night could end up as a disaster. Look, look but at last night. It could night. also go really well. You have to look at it from both ends of the spectrum, and like, there's people who are like, well, you know, if we wreck, Rick Spencer Walt was gonna go. Unfortunately, his motor let go before mm-hmm. in practice. Um, yeah, you know, even Joe Chisholm, Joe here, uh, he spots for Josh Dotty in the in the APC series. Um, and he picks and he spots like Andrew Ranger in the NASCAR Pinty series. So he sees a lot of this, and obviously he re- operates. Um, he's a co-host of Race Time Radio. Um, you know, it, he goes okay. Ontario Late Malls. Y'all can never complain about about payouts or the cost of racing ever again. Ten thousand dollars to win, one hundred and twenty three laps, three eighths of a mile, eight hundred eight hundred to start. Event heavily marketed and promoted. Only sixteen cars show up. Now, I do have a counter argument. Would it have been a much bigger deal if? G Force TV got prom- got asked to come film the event live. If I we got so. it on Racing America down in the states, would it have done better? Because a lot of these people, I feel like they only run their cars when G Force is is operating, because it gives them that TV exposure that other guys are looking for. Mm-hmm. Now I could be wrong, but again, let me know in the comments. Shoot me a message. Like I, I I want to see racing succeed so bad. And if people aren't willing to show Mm -hmm. up and I get it, there's certain circumstances where absolutely, you know, it's, it's understandable, but we need to support these programs or guess what? We're, we, we're going to have a nice lot of equipment with nowhere to go. I think they need to, sit down and almost have like a big driver's meeting with everything and just talk and take a poll like figure out 
what is the reasoning? Because I mean, if you even look at Flambo, what do they have? Three super stocks that show up. Yep. It's like, what is the reasoning for these drivers not showing up even on a weekly basis? Like, because I have seen a lot of people say, oh, the payout's not enough for me. Okay, well, you just had $10,000. You potentially could have won $10,000. So, like, now what is your reasoning? Like, it's almost like there's no winning with that stuff. There, r- racing has always been a losing proposition. Mm-hmm. You're You're not making money over the course of the event. No. Like a set of tires is I've heard about around twelve hundred dollars, fourteen hundred dollars um for the pro late malls. And of course, like you're running 123 laps, you're gonna want a sticker set for that. Like yeah. I, I I don't know. It's just it's such a complicated t- uh topic and, and I really hope we see more uh I'm hoping maybe we'll see more conversation because I I think that may be an upcoming topic on race rivals race chat. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping to to see how that goes, but um, you know, maybe I'm going to have to tune in Tuesday night and, and see if I can see, see what other people are saying. Cause like I, there's times where I want to put, put my mouth, put my money where my mouth is, but at the same time, like, it's kind of like nice to sit there and see what other people's opinions are because I'd rather, yeah, I want to see where people are coming from with it. And yeah. and I I want to we're gonna uh, continue on with this conversation, but we do after the show after uh our we're done after we complete our conversation with our guests tonight, but we have the guys from the Southern Ontario Dirt Show waiting on us, so I think we're let's hit a pause button on this, and uh, let's bring in those bring in them guys. Mm-hmm. All right, so before we do that, we're gonna have a quick word from a presenting sponsor. Vision 20 Studios. You're diving into Vision 20 Editing. New company with their services providing video editing to get your video perfect in exactly the way you guys are looking for. They also do audio mastering where they're going to take your audio into crisp and clear. They're bringing your vision to life. That is right at Vision 20 Editing. We want to make sure that your vision comes to life in the way you want it. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at vision 20 studios now let's get back to the true north racing podcast and joining us now is the duo from the southern ontario dirt show we got travis cunningham and jonathan howe joining us boys how are you guys doing good good doing great thanks for having us no problem we're excited to have you um so this this is our second crossover episode we had we've had stickers and scuffs guys on now we got you boys on. Now we're we're excited to talk to you guys because dirt holds a lot of uh special interest in for Megan and myself. We love going to Oshawa on a Friday night. I love traveling down to Merrittville on on a Saturday night when when the timing allows me to. But uh let's let's get into it on and Travis, let's talk with you first. How did you so I t- tell us a little bit about yourself first? Okay, so yeah, how I got into racing. Uh, that's Uh, through my dad he was a big drag racer and engine builder he's in the canadian drag racing hall of fame and uh yeah just grew up at the i'm a dirt kid now but i grew up a lot at the pavement tracks like flamborough was my weekly deal uh in like 95 i think i started going there all the time and uh yeah so basically through that and then uh race go-karts on pavement ovals as well and uh 2000 four we decided to move up and like the big world of stock cars we can't really couldn't really afford the whole tire game and all that and we're lucky around here like a lot of dirt tracks can be hard on tires but we're lucky around here none of ours around here are so that's the only reason i could really go stock cars is because uh because of the tire thing and that we were able to run tires like back when i started 358 modifieds we'd run like two two right rears a year and we'd be able to get around that so that's how we were able to do that yeah so yeah Merrittville looks really easy on tires and then uh so yeah started 2004 and 358 modifieds did that until 2009 and then I got a ride in a sprint car with uh, Eric McNeven Craig Downey was his driver before that Craig used to run hobby cars and stuff like that 
but I say I took over for Craig with Eric and then raced from that until 2014, then took a little bit off. And then I've now got my own team, which I race every Friday night and on the SOS tour when I can. That's awesome. And uh, Jonathan, how about you? How did you get involved in motorsports? I mean, I was a lifelong racing fan. I, I think uh, I, I think the earliest I can remember watching a NASCAR race on TV was uh, probably like the year 2000. I think it was like six years old, maybe. And I can remember I feel like a, that was the year Kyle Petty had the Hot Wheels car or one of the years he had that. And then I can remember seeing uh, Jeff Gordon's name scroll across the top of the screen. And I was like, oh, JG, that's close to my initials, JH. I'm going to be a fan of the 24. And then sure enough, I just get completely obsessed with racing and with NASCAR from there on out. Live, basically live my life watching the Speed Channel growing up. And then uh, in high school, I wrote, I had a creative writing class and it, it was during the time when Dan Weldon actually passed away. And I was a fan of Dan and in, in IndyCar. And I ended up writing a, like a little like story tribute, almost like what would be something you'd see in like Sports Illustrated, I guess, kind of. And my teacher was like, oh, that was really good. Like, if you're into motorsports, like, maybe you should pursue, like, motorsports journalism or something. Um, and at that point, I had already raced. I raced two years of go-karts at the, uh, uh, I think they called it, like, the Cameron Motorplex, but it's now called the Canadian Mini Indy up in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, I did their Arrive and Drive Rookie Series. And I was never very good at it. I I sucked for the first two years that I raced. Um, I've actually gone back this year and had a lot more success now as an adult, but as a 13, 14 year old, I was not very good. So uh, I quickly realized I didn't have much of a career in driving, even though I never got a chance to try an oval, which is where I would have wanted to go with it anyways. But uh, so I go to university for a, a bit in journalism, take a little detour to pursue music, uh, which leads me to get like kind of a background in audio engineering and and uh, putting together, you know, music and stuff like that digitally. And uh, you know, then I was like, okay, I got to do something else with my life. Like music's not really taken off. I don't want to tour the world. And I came back to motorsports. Uh, I ended up going back to school for radio broadcasting. Uh, figured I was either going to get into music radio or sports play-by-play. -play. Uh, I was basically always just trying to get back to my dream. I, I wrote in my high school yearbook that, you know, that in 20 years, uh, I said that I would be uh, calling the Daytona 500. So uh, in a way, I've just been trying to get back to that uh, dream that 17-year-old me set out for myself. So uh, yeah, I did two years of radio broadcasting at Mohawk. Can't recommend that program enough. And got out, uh, walked into Merrittville Speedway. I think I maybe sent an email to Merrittville Speedway. I was like, hey, do you guys need an announcer by chance? Um, and that was actually, oddly enough, I was suggested to do that by Ron Fellows, who I got a chance to speak with because uh, the inter I interned on a show for TSN 1150 radio in Hamilton, which is now no, no longer there. But uh, And one of the radio hosts there had a connection with Ron. He's like, oh, if you're really into racing, like you should talk to Ron about it. I'm like, well, how am I going to talk to Ron? He's like, oh, I'll get you his phone number. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to call Ron Fellows. He's like, yeah, do it. Just like see what he would recommend for how to get into it from a media standpoint. And one thing led to another. I talked to Ron. He's like, yeah, just like you're close to merit. They'll see what see what they're doing, see if they're hiring. And then if they're not, check the next couple tracks down the road, right? So one thing leads to another. I ended up uh, it just perfect timing. Uh, I, I did a year basically on uh, with Stephen Petty and kind of learned from him. And then the pandemic happened and I was kind of on my own for two years. And that uh, that's one way to get really good at broadcasting is to work by yourself for an entire two years. So yeah, it's just been chasing the media dream ever since uh, ever since then. Nice. And where did the whole idea come from to start the Southern Ontario Dirt Show? I think Travis actually brought it to me because we had a, a one of the no nights way. when I was alone. No, I think it was you because I was in the booth at Merrittville in 2020 or 2021. And Erica's like, Jonathan, like, you need a little help every once in a while. Like, let me get you somebody who can, like, call a race with you and just to give you a break for a night so you're not losing your voice by the end of the night. And Travis was one of the people that she suggested. And Travis came and called a race with me. And I think it was Travis. Travis went like, yeah, do you want to do, would you ever be interested in doing, like, a podcast? And I was like, yeah, that that could be interesting. I'm like, what, like, what, what could that kind of work? And then it kind of ended up on the back burner. And then 
I don't remember where it went from there. I think I, I must have reached out or you maybe reached back out to me. And we we're like, yeah, let's do this. My whole version then. of the story is the exact same, except <laughs> I thought he brought it up first. I could have swore he brought it up. I thought it was you, buddy. <laughs> I don't know. We started announcing at Merrittville together. That's for sure. Yeah. And then we went for yeah. chicken wings at his favorite place in the falls. And then that was for real. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. hatched it uh, early last year and uh, haven't yeah. looked back. 61 episodes mainly because there wasn't anything else going on on the dirt side really like clinton and adam did some dirt stuff but then they did start doing a lot more pavement stuff and then that's when i really was like hmm dirt only show that's awesome uh so okay so now i gotta ask because i feel like i'm a big chicken wing connoisseur where's your (laughs) best place to have chicken wings down in the falls because i was just there last night Ooh. okay so my (laughs) go-to um and i'd say uh you know, I'd say cough up money, but uh, these guys, have they've sponsored plenty of stuff over time. So, but if they want to get back involved with the Southern Ontario Dirt Show, we'll make it happen. But Chip and Charlie's, <laughs> that is where the Southern Ontario Dirt Show was born. We sat there with a pen and paper. We both had a pound of wings. And uh, yeah, my go-to is uh, always Chip and Charlie's. I'm spoiled in the falls. There's so many places to get good chicken wings in this city, uh, being so close to the border. I feel like we, uh, the Niagara region really knows how to do chicken wings. It's just a matter of whether you prefer them Canadian style like me, which is breaded, or uh, if you'd like a true buffalo wing with no breading. But either way, most bars will do them both ways. Well, now I think I found my new next restaurant when I go down to the falls. Um, hey, if you're ever when you're in town, let me know. I'll take you out for some wings there. Hey, I was just there last night. We, me and my fiance went down to uh, Niagara on the lake for uh, to catch a sunset, and we had some uh, Rose City pizza earlier in the night. So over go. in uh, Welland, nice. so. But no, I glad, glad chicken wings got brought up because I've been craving them so bad lately. Uh, <laughs> so obviously with six, as you said, sixty-one episodes, and you guys have been continue going strong. This is actually one of my Megan. You're gonna really enjoy this. One of the coolest things I love about when I listen to your guys' show is at the start of every episode, you guys have to think of a driver that runs that number for the episode. So. I got to know, how did that idea come about? And what's the hardest name you guys have had to find to think for, for one of the numbers? Oh, John just did it one day. I think we started on 11. If you do the first 10, there isn't any. We should go back and do the, those ones. Yeah. But, Maybe when yeah. we get back to like the 100s, because like, I don't think there's a ton. <laughs> that of was John's idea, though. He just dropped it one day. I think uh, I may have, I'm not going to lie, I may have stole that idea. I feel like they used to do that on... Um. Oh, I can't remember the two guys that did it. One of them is an analytics guy. Uh, oh, and the other person's Alan Kavana. Alan Kavana, who is a NASCAR reporter, some people might know. Uh, Alan Kavana used to host a, a show about NASCAR analytics with another guy. I think his name was David Smith. I don't remember 100%. He works at Roush Fenway now. So they had to shut down the podcast because he couldn't be spilling secrets anymore with Brad Keselowski paying him to do the big bucks, uh, big buck data stuff. So, But uh, they used to do a show, and I think they used to do a deep dive on one driver to start every episode with who ran that number and i think i i don't want to say i fully copied it but i was just like i wonder if we could do that with dirt where we could shout out some names from the past as well as feature some of the local guys now who are running those numbers by you know okay so this is episode 12 who runs 12 right now oh well we should talk about a heavy chevy chad chevalier yeah let's give him a shout out and then darren dryden right and then you know travis usually has he Travis is much more the historian compared to me, uh, especially with the, the local stuff. So um, he kind of is the one who will dig up some older names that maybe I might not even have heard of, or if I've heard of, I've, I've never seen them race. So it kind of works out well that way. And I think the hardest number so far was 59. But honestly, yes. most of them have been pretty easy. I was going to say, I was just listening to 59 the other week here. And I was, and yeah. that, that kind of what sparked the spark ticks that you guys were saying that, but I was wondering if there was maybe an episode I didn't catch it, and you guys had a harder time finding a finding a name <clears throat> for that number. I feel like there, there might have been maybe one or two in the thirties. I feel like there's not a ton of drivers with numbers in the thirties when I think about it. Like, I know I think of thirty two, Mark Fawcett. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think some we of had like mid thirties. We used Gary Elliott for thirty six. I think. <laughs> Yeah, we had to cheat and on I that th- one. I, and I t- think I hey, said, he did. I said, dirt. Um, he did. I believe we did have another dirt one. I just can't think of it offhand. But uh, yeah, thirty six was, was light. It was a slack Pinty's car. 
Oh yeah, Slack. Right. Yeah, thirty six was a tough one. Just last year. Go. Last year, the one yeah. start so far, and it was uh, uh it was Dave Bailey piloting the Slack uh, thirty six uh, yep. Pinty's car for Rosh Weekend last year. So I, I think that was that was one of the harder ones. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a, it's always fun seeing that kind of stuff. And I know Megan, that that's one of Megan's mm-hmm. question favorite questions to ask is usually what is um what is the driver's favorite number? So sorry, I'm gonna steal this phone on you, Megan. Sorry. <laughs> Travis, how how did that number 90 come about for you? Okay. That one's a long story. So back to my dad. So that uh he his drag racing class was modified eliminator which was basically poor man's pro stock. And in 1982, NHRA closed that class. And then they had a big uh, uh, protest and everything. The whole class ran up and down this chute protesting, but it didn't work. NHRA still said, get out of here. So then that totally took the wind out of my dad's sails for drag racing. So then he bought uh, uh, the Ron Box 68 car that that Terry Kitchen drove and Earl Ross drove. And then, uh, yeah put it into a number 29 and then they let Earl Ross drive that first season. And then my dad got tired of uh, having to give Earl the whole hundred percent of the pay. So they hired Stomp and Tom Walters for the next season and to give him his own little brand, they switched it to number 90 because it goes like nine Oh, and it's been around ever since then Pee Wee Evans. Uh, like my entire career, like when I was a kid, I followed Pee Wee Evans around and his dad, Billy still helps me big time on my sprint car now. So like f- challengers at Flamborough, late models at Mossport, super late models at Mossport. He was our number 90 as well. And then he ran it in a sprint car as well. So that's just our family number, number 90, because it goes like 9-0. And Jonathan, how do you how do you feel and how do you like announcing at Merrittville? Like, how do you feel you need to approach each night? So honestly, when I started out, I... It, it came, a, I don't want to say it came easy to me because I definitely had to put work in and I still have to put work into it. Um, I would honestly say uh, this year has actually been a bit of a challenge because we haven't had the Merrittville coverage on G-Force. So usually I was going back um, and air checking myself, if you will, and, and kind of being like, okay, I messed up that call. I, I messed up this. I need to say that better. I need to explain myself more. I haven't had the chance to do that as much this year. And uh, that's actually created a bit more of a challenge challenge for me but in terms of how i enjoy it i mean it's it's a great way to get you know uh, i don't want to say it's a living because i only do it one night a week but to go out and and work a job that that doesn't really feel like much of a job it's incredibly fun especially doing the play-by-play stuff and i think probably you know i've called you know 17 million nascar races on my bedroom floor with die casts so it, it came naturally to me not necessarily uh that i've worked it a long time but uh, that that play-by-play style i i explain it like this i say it's like you have to answer the 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 who what where when why how questions you have to do that as fast as possible at all times so it's like i watch two cars going in the corner who are the two cars uh where are they going they're going in turn one uh what's happening they're side by side they're battling for six position they're uh how are they racing uh this guy's on the low side this guy's on the outside right so it's answering those questions as fast as you possibly can um, and accurate, accurately as you can uh, without falling behind. Because you could literally be in the middle of a sentence and all of a sudden, you know, somebody gets spun out or somebody makes contact and you, your entire thought process, thought process has to change and reflect that. So, but it's such an incredible experience. I love it very, I love it so much. And um announcing is it, it's a lot of fun as much fun as it could be to be out on a on a saturday night i think it's almost more fun because i don't have to pay any bills at the end of the night <laughs> i don't have to worry about any damage i don't have to worry about uh hurting anybody's feelings really i mean I, there's hurt feelings but usually oh, you can hurt feelings just... as an announcer that is a <laughs> fact I can hurt feelings, but usually it requires me to go to their facebook page and read the post nobody ever really <laughs> directly calls me out on anything so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I I, Ryan, I feel that. <laughs> Ryan Turner had a little bit of beef in Victory Lane Friday at Oswegan. If you caught that on the broadcast, what? Yeah, that's gonna be. That's oh, I missed that. To talk about on the show. Yeah, go back and check it out. He was a little, little miffed. Oh man, now I got it. I'm I. So yeah. I went to Oswegan on Friday night, and we left because obviously they rushed through the program, and we yeah. left just as they were um, finishing up with the crate sprints. 
Right. So we were we were walking out, and I kind of heard something. I thought I heard something. I'm like, ah, if I if anything happens, I'll probably hear about it on Facebook the next day. I didn't hear nothing. So now now it's now you guys funny. are making me have to go back and take a look. Which <laughs> I mean, I don't mind. I love watching Austin Weekend. So as I was gonna say, it's yeah. the best part of the G Force, right? Is that you, we have that to go back to. Uh, if you do miss something or if you do want to go back and catch up to something, not to, uh, not that I'm trying to get a job as GeForce or anything <laughs> like that, but I, I do really appreciate what they, uh, they've they done and they're kind of paving the way for all of us to follow suit in, in the world of uh, dirt and, and racing broadcasting in general. So uh, it's been nice uh, to have those to go back and helps me stay uh, up to date on what Travis is up to and how he ran. Although I have a hard time, I'm not going to lie, I have a hard time watching Travis race now. Huh? Why? Because you're you're my friend, but then also I've got my opinions on how you should drive the car, and, <laughs> oh. and I watch it, and then I start swearing at the TV like, "Why did he make that move? What are you doing? Oh, Why are you geez. going there? Go there, go do that." And then he'll make a pass, and I'll be like, "Oh, maybe I need to shut up." <laughs> I just do the I... same thing. Oh, he just doesn't like that I run the bottom, but he forgets like Mitch Brown's a bottom feeder, so with Ollie Porter, it's not just me. I don't know how wide and handsome. That's what I think of a sprint car, but you gotta do. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta run know your everywhere. strengths. Yes, that is true. Yeah, because I tried uh, it at Humberstone for a and blew her off the end. Didn't work. Didn't work. No. I I think it's absolutely hysterical how you feel about that because Megan being on the on the show with her, I make sure I get up to the fence and watch her as much as I can because if I'm at the track, I'm usually covering the uh, Canadian Vintage Modifieds. So I'm either down mm-hmm. in the pits or over in the chute waiting with those guys to go up on track. And so if they run just before me, I don't, I miss, I miss her race. Sorry, Megan. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when I get up there and I'm watching, cause I, I, their, their family has become very much part of our family. Um, They've been, they've become very good friends with us. So like I've, her siblings have been racing this year. So I've gone to the fence last week. I was up there racing. There's a wreck going into one and her sister was coming in hot as hell like and i'm just like check out check out check out there's a wreck in front of you check out the tail end of it i'm like god damn it <laughs> but i was i'm like i can't i can't stand up here and watch it because because you're right you get your own opinions and then stuff happens like but to be fair i know megan's gonna so in a few weeks here i will have my first ever shot at getting behind the wheel of a stock car Oh, uh, nice. Some wow. friends of mine have set up a bone stock deal with uh, Chris Lawrence down at Delaware. And so I get to drive a, a bone stock. So now I really get to put my money where my mouth is <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to that event, because now I'm going to be able to have more of an understanding of what those guys go through. And now I know Megan's going to come on the show that week and criticize the heck out of my driving. <laughs> oh, and she should. <laughs> part of the reason i'm kind of happy that travis hasn't actually watched me race any go-karts yet uh, that i because I, I know he's gonna have more than a few notes i'm sure for me oh uh, yeah well at ranceville you run the there's only it's hard when there's only four guys to bust you too much yeah that's the, the fun class at ranceville is uh although i don't know what it's gonna hopefully be like. this week uh, there's more yeah we'll this week it, uh, i'm coming for sure and you better be ready Okay. All right. So <laughs> second second trip on dirt, uh second time on an oval ever. So hopefully it goes well, especially with the extra added pressure, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, the bottom okay. feeder thing, when you own your own car, you're a bottom feeder because that's how you keep her <laughs> off the tow truck for the most part. If you go back and look like a lot of uh big time car owners like Don Kreit sticks to mind. He was a bottom feeder and one time at a meeting, like it was like Fred Raymer and Donnie Kreitz. And uh, Fred was be like, well, I run the high side and real hard because my car owner wants me to bring back the checker flag or the steering wheel. And Don runs the middle to the bottom because he has to pay the bills, stuff like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, you know what? There's, there's nothing wrong with being a bottom feeder as long as you're you're fast down there. Right? I can run the cushion when I can, I can run a cushion. I can do that. Like two of my three wins at Oshwegan are on the cush. But like that's because there's a ledge there and you can feel it. But when it gets to the point where there's like no cushion and you gotta kind of like make it momentum and kind of find your bite, at that point I'm better at running the bottom. So I'll switch there. I was but if there's say, a cushion, I can do it. Kind of like but, Friday night, it didn't seem like there was really a built-up cushion on the high side there. No, 
yeah, they've been uh, getting it slick, in my opinion, because the Pinty's cars are coming. So it's going to be slick the next three shows. And then after that, it's going to start, we're going to have to worry about Pinty's cars no more. Then, in my opinion, it'll start turning into a more of a cushion thing like we saw earlier in the year as well. That's what I think. Because the Pinty's, they got to have it slick. Yeah. Just in time for the Sprint Car Nats, too. Nationals is always slick, yeah. But those shows in between there, those are the ones where you can get hammered down nice. Because like Ashwikin, when it's got a little bite in the track, like it's wide open, no lifting, no brakes, no nothing. And that's pretty cool to do that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so obviously with with it's kind of awesome because, you know, Jonathan yourself, I, I can't I can't say the same as being an announcer. But on our show here, I'm kind of someone who's just very much into motorsports. I kind of decided to start doing this because I, I loved motorsports and I wanted to, I didn't feel like there was enough people talking about motorsports. So that's why we kind of started the true North Racy podcast. And then of course I brought on Megan Mitchell as a co-host because, well, I'm not driving. I kind of need someone who can, who can tell me about what's going on. Um, so I love the same, it feels like it's the same dynamic on your guys' end as you not be, really be behind the wheel of a car and Travis over here being behind the wheel of a car. Um, you did talk about it earlier about not being able to watch him race when he does make a trip down to Merrittville, does it make it easier to call races or do you like to try and call him out maybe when he is racing? So I try to, I think I get a, not accused, but definitely the one criticism I think people have made about me is that I play favorites and that I have my favorite drivers out there. Uh, Travis likes to bug me about Nelson Mason's because he was in a, uh, came from the formula one world at first. So that, and he's from the falls uh, and he's from the falls so he's <laughs> like oh you have a bias towards him you automatically like him and i'm like no i just he's a good story to talk about i'm a fan of good stories at the end of the day uh travis breaking a winless streak that dates back to did we say 2012 are we that yeah. is that where we're at yeah if if travis broke that streak that'd be an amazing story regardless of the fact that he's my co-host that i consider him uh, a good friend now um but I I try to make sure that I'm even like just because Travis is running ninth like his dad's race that we called earlier the Gary Cunningham Memorial like I think he were running around just inside the top 10 ninth eight, eight. ninth yeah and I was keeping an eye on it but I was also keeping an eye on it because you were involved in a good battle so you know if things get a little bit thin in the top five that's a battle that I can go back to and, and keep an eye on um but I gotta make sure to try to spread that love around as much as I can because at the end of the day nobody wants to feel ignored, you know, like just because a driver's having a run in 17th, if they're making a great charge at the end of the race and they've gone 20th to 17th, I still should try to, you know, acknowledge that as best I can during a broadcast. And um, again, it's very different with Merrittville not having uh, the G force coverage that we had previously. Uh, it, I don't think those situations make as much difference. Cause you know, there's some fans that tune in using the radio FM uh, in person and obviously to them they're here in the race call clear as day but you know when the whole pack is on the back stretch okay you're probably going to hear me but if the whole pack is coming together down the front stretch there's a good chance that you might not hear my call 100 accurately and i know that so i i try not to get um i try not to, start to tell stories or anything and that kind of helps me keep it not personal and more objective um because there's less to talk about like Nobody cares that I'm talking about somebody who's having a great run in points because they can't hear me, right? So, and it changes the series too, right? Obviously, the mini stocks, I feel like you can talk over a little bit easier compared to when the modifieds go by and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, we know I like Colin Travis's races. Uh, I don't, um, I don't love, I don't love the fact that, um, you know, anytime there's a big wreck obviously i think about that stuff and i think about everybody like that that's my i think the hardest part of my job is anytime there's a big crash like i it's not that i get a loss for words but i'm kind of the person that like i don't want to keep talking like there's not there's not much to say that car just flipped over it was a silent it was a quiet quick rollover that was a violent rollover whatever the situation is i don't want to get into it too much until I have confirmation that from safety crews that, Oh, things are okay. Or that's good. Or that's bad or whatever, wait, whatever the situation is. I remember when I finished fourth last year, my first night of the year at Merrittville, it was, you called my name quite a bit on that one. I remember that. And there's G force <laughs> of that one. And then what else was I going to say? The thing uh, where you just said they can't hear you anyways. 
I saw pictures from the RPM when the short track super series went there on Tuesday and they have their speakers like hanging out from the top of the bleachers and then down, like, on, like all their speakers are on top of the fans like this. So there, hmm. that track, I guarantee you, you can hear when <laughs> oh, you're yeah. talking. And that always is a huge thing is not being able to hear the, because I, when I announce, I think the same thing, because a lot of tracks you can't hear when the cars are going around. Yeah. But Quebec tracks, they step it up. Quebec tracks, they spare. I thought no that was so cool. Make sure the, they was, they always make sure the fan experience is the best, right? Yeah, they do do that. From uh, Just, so we had Adam Adam Ross on here a few weeks ago, and he was telling us that the fans in Quebec, when it comes to motorsports, are absolutely a different animal. And he said he's that so right. uh, what what track were they at? I think it was Shorty Air or something like that. And he showed us a picture. He's like this this grandstand is probably the same amount as what Flambro has, but for whatever reason they they take in that racing aspect out there and it, it's just one of those things we're trying to feed a southern ontario uh show to people but it's getting harder and harder to, to for it, people from more or less bigger cities to come out to that kind of stuff so i kind of want to touch base on what do you think we need to do in ontario that switches up from quebec to get those Ooh. people out there you want to start with that one, Travis, or you want me to go first? I can start Travis? a little bit, just because I've talked yeah, about it on it. our show. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just the fans themselves. Like, uh, a good analogy I use is, like, if you had a Super Dirt Car Series big block race at Merrittville and ask 60 bucks to get into it, because that's basically what you got to pay now to cover the sanctioning fee. And if you want to make a little money as a track to pull something in that big, you'd have to charge 60 bucks a head to get into the grandstands, roughly. And uh, the difference between Ontario fans and Quebec fans, like if the Maryville did it, there'd be a lot of people online complaining about the 60 bucks to get in, whereas the Quebec people just, they can't wait to get in and they'll bring their friends. I just don't know what it is about that. Like, I don't know how to bring that here. Is uh, They've been thinking about that. Like, it's this has been like that since the 70s. Like, my dad would always talk about how the drag races were better back then and how the parties there were completely insane and stuff like that and just people everywhere and how much they, they just love it so much more up there. I don't know what it is. I think the biggest thing is um, in Southern Ontario, the biggest pa- problem we have is just how much there is to do here. Mm. When I think of Quebec, I think there's, I don't want to say there's less competition. You know, they still have the Montreal Alouettes during the summertime. They've got a CFL team to support, but I just don't see the the same level of things to go and do. Like if you ask the average person, whether they would rather spend a hundred bucks to go to, a Blue Jay game on a Saturday night and get their tickets, get their beer, get their go transits or whatever else. Or would you rather spend 35 to go to your local dirt race that you might not have experienced? Everybody knows what the Blue Jays is and they're going to make that decision to go there versus not everybody knows about dirt racing. And that's another reason why we got into the podcast that we did is because, you know, I, even I admittedly didn't go to Merrittville a ton when I was growing up. Like I went here and there but I was always a uh, pavement, you know, watcher. And I, my family would rather save up and go to Pocono or we, you know, we went and did trips to Homestead, Miami for the championship for NASCAR and go to yeah. those events, then go and watch this local short track stuff. Uh, but it, oddly enough, when I was a kid, I went to more junior B hockey games than I ever went to NHL games. And that's kind of what dirt track and, and and local short track racing is it's kind of like junior b and junior c hockey it's you know there's no reason look at Merrittville speedway look at the talent that have come that's come through our doors look at the fact that uh you know we've had a uh, matt williamson go and become a super dirt car champion right uh from the modified program at Merrittville. like that that's the top level of modified racing really in the northeast and i so there's no reason that our drivers, our stars can't climb the ranks the same way somebody who's breaking into junior B hockey, like Ethan Morrow, when I was a kid watching him play for the Niagara Falls Canucks or train with them at least. Right. So I think that's the biggest thing is that we just have to get people out to it one time. And then generally they end up enjoying their experience. And if we can make them understand a little bit more about the sport with a podcast, with auxiliary, entertainment productions that that goes a long way i think to making 
lifelong fans and keeping it affordable too. Like that's the other thing that, it, and which is obviously so hard with inflation and everything else that we're facing, but keeping things affordable is going to be what keeps racing alive, both for drivers and teams and, and uh, spectators as well. For sure. Uh, there's a, definitely a lot to unpack there. And and <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for both of you guys' answers on that because it's, it's, I think you guys are right. We're trying to, you know, like to this year alone, we brought um, my fiance's sister with us to Oshwegan Speedway. I, th- I think that was what, like early May, maybe. I think it was around your birthday. I think I know that. Yeah. Um, and she absolutely fell in love with it. We took her again this Friday night. She had more fun sitting down in turn four and just getting smacked in the face with all the dirt. <laughs> the- <laughs> yeah. But that's the same the thing. Experience. With, oh my god, you you think like some people like, and and she, and she's not the kind of person that would like to get dirty. Like she she's very much. I don't know. I'm not going to say it because it's going to sound bad. No matter which way I try to say it, um, she's very much more of like like I like my fiance is more rugged. She she played sports growing up, not afraid to get dirty. Her sister is a little more prim and proper. And but we took her to Oshkosh yeah. on a Friday night we took her down to turn four. She put her goggles on and she just, this is what it's like down here. I'm like, yeah, this is what it's like down here. You just get smacked in the face with dirt. And this is why Jacqueline likes coming here so much. Say, <laughs> turn one's actually... even worse. Oh, but turn one is way worse. Turn one hurts. <laughs> Especially at Ash weekend. Uh, okay. So now maybe the next time I'm going to have to sit down and turn one. Cause I haven't it sat really down hurts. there yet. Does it? Yeah. We if you sit it. real low, like right where we pitch it in. Yeah. Oh, the mud clods that come into the stands is, it gets your attention. It's like paintballs. Like, uh, it's like getting hit with paintballs. <laughs> yeah, that is actually a good act, good comparison. We took um, mm-hmm. Carl Brown from uh, 97.7 Hits FM. He co-hosts the morning show where I work uh, in radio. And uh, Carl's a sprint car guy like from out west. And he went grew up going to tracks in Washington. Gadget. But he hadn't been out since uh, he he's moved to Ontario. And uh, so I took him to the sprint car Nats last year. And we sat down in turn one. And he was just like, he, you could tell he was like a little bit annoyed with with how close we had to sit down just because there was uh, it was the Nats and it was a big crowd and it was busy right but at the same time he was I could see like that uh the nostalgia smile coming back to him about getting smacked in the face with dirt and there were there were a couple clumps that we had to dodge I would say that came through the fence and broke up a little bit but yeah th- it's just an experience right like it's so hard to explain to people like oh this is why I love dirt racing or this is why I love you know racing in general it's something you have to experience even when i was a kid uh, you know and just obsessed with just nascar and you know i'd go to school and be like well how can you watch guys turn left for 400 laps like i don't understand how that's entertaining and i'm like you have to be there like Mm -hmm. i i went and watched kyle larson run an inch from the miami homestead wall for 400 laps straight and i was there to watch jeff gordon's last race and i literally was watching kyle larson more than i was watching jeff and i was like Jeff could win a championship. What am I doing? Why am I not watching Kyle Larson? But if you get into the sport, you learn the nuances, you start to understand about what it is that exactly you're seeing. That's what'll make you a fan for life, mm-hmm. right? It, it, that, that's that's how I explain it to people. It's like, you just have to go once or twice, talk to a few people who are into it, who can explain it to you. And then you'll be hooked because you'll be like, wow, wow. Look at what Netflix did for Formula One. It's oh, yeah. not like Formula One is the most exciting thing, but all of a sudden when you break it down to for people, you create the narrative, oh, there's two guys, they drive basically the same car, but one guy drives better than the other one, and that's making this other guy potentially lose his job. Like You start to explain the nuances to people, and now everybody's hooked on Formula One. Meanwhile, at pretty much any racing product in the world besides – I no, there's pretty much no other racing product in the world that is worse than – formula one right now and at least in terms of parody so i don't know definitely not and i i think you're absolutely right there and that's why like so on on my side is i'd like to to put out a lot as much in-car footage as i'm able to i have three gopros that when i'm with the cvms i put them in i try to put them in three different cars um sorry not just three different cars but three different cars per practice session so six that's six videos and then three and another three for each feature. Because I think the more content and videos we put out of not just of not just the guys sitting there, like Megan, I'm sorry, but you guys put the camera in the wrong spot. No one wants to I see know. a real cam. 
I always see their camera on the top pointed down. I'm like, no one wants to see that because it looks like you're going out for a Sunday drive. I've been saying for two years, it needs to change. (laughs) Where to put it to have people understand that it's not just a Sunday drive and they casually turn left. Show me in car. Mm -hmm. Because when you like, I'm, I'm, I've got to get down to Oshbegan on a Friday night because, um, one of the drivers I work with is running a crate sprint, uh, Cam Thompson. One of the deals with our packages is that he gets a vlog this year. So I need to get down there on a Friday night to actually shoot a vlog with him to be put up. Well, guess what? I'm trusting him with my GoPros. So I'm really hoping they come back in one piece. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know. There's like screen th- protectors to get like where you, it's just like a, like we put over it. Cause yeah, you got to do that under, I don't know if you do it on your pavement ones. Uh, well, but like dirt can beat up GoPros <laughs> bad. So, well, funny enough, this is uh, this is this is the first ever GoPro I got. It was a it was a Hero Seven, and oh I don't know if you guys can see it. There is a crack that goes yeah. right across the middle of it, <laughs> right right down the middle of it. So if it sits just right, it actually doesn't. You you don't see the 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 piece, so it actually works out. But I've been using that for the for the footage going at the driver, <laughs> because I use this yeah. on a front bumper of a CVM. And when I had it, it was the bars here and he, the GoPro is here. And it was no more than like three inches off the ground. And when it came back, instead of it looking like this, it was like this. Oops. <laughs> yep. That's it, it, right. It wasn't pointed the right way, but no, I, I know I'm going to need to get some screen protectors for it when I take it to the dirt. Cause I know there's a possibility it ain't coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I, on a I heavier night. Imagine. Yeah, like back in the day, Ash Weekend used to get pretty heavy, and like we go through like a full stack of Teros ten in a heat race and an eight lap heat. So that's like Jeez. at least one a lap. So yeah, not as bad like that anymore today, but uh, yeah, it's just not quite as bad. But like back in the day, they'd break your spark plugs off. It's Jeez. just the mud clods. Yep. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about because we're seeing a lot of high high point or high money races down in the States. You know, we just had the Eldora million not too long ago. Uh, I think what is, I think the Panties race is $25,000 to win each night or something like that. Um, so we know the car counts for those events are absolutely going to be ridiculous. I'm hoping the Panties series pulls out about 30 cars. I'm going to be honest. I really hope they 30 cars get out for that race. Um, today at Flambro, we had a $10,000 win pro late model race. And we only had 16 cars show up. Mm-hmm. So what makes it more enticing for guys to go for? I, I It's like a $10,000 to win race on dirt compared to an asphalt. What, like, why, why are we seeing minimal car counts in one, one area compared to others? I would say just because it's a little cheaper to run dirt over the pro late mile at Lambro, even though it was 1500 to start still for them guys. Right. Right. It was so uh, like 800 to start, yeah. 800 to start, so okay, yeah. So our Sprint Car Nationals is 1,000 to start. So that if you for like a guy like me who's low budget and stuff like that, if you just qualify for the Nationals, that's like a second place finish on a normal night. So that's why that race is so big. And uh, but yeah, that's tough for Flambro today. But uh, yeah, but like does 800 even cover your tires for like the start money or like a thousand? No. That's just the whole thing. Like guys want to at least break even or a lot of racers have like we have to look to break at least break even when we're going to the track these days that's the tough tough thing and a lot of times like i've talked about it a lot where it's like you could have took a little bit money off the top it still would have been a big paying race up top like you could have made a five thousand win and spread that other five throughout who knows that's why I, my gary cunningham memorial this year at maryville that's what i tried to do although uh Tammy 10 media made it 3000 to win off the top, but I made it 350 to start, which is a good deal for us sprint cars. And it was like uh, over 400 for 10th and stuff like that. But our nights are just so much cheaper. Cause we like really, we only run 31 laps in a night, 35, 25 plus eight, 33 plus three, 36 laps a night. So. Damn. Most pavement guys do that in practice, right? <laughs> like you guys go there and practice all day. We, we, uh, we get, we get two, <laughs> Yeah. Two two ten lap practices, if not about five minutes at least. So I could run about fifteen laps. 
and then yeah. two features. And if it's the pro lates, they're running 25 to 30 laps. Yeah, 123 laps. That was a tough one for Flint. Like if they would have made it maybe less laps, they could have got more cars. But who knows? Because like there was... like pro lates, they like making those big long races too. Yeah, it's like... so hard. Like at the end of the yeah. day, like the expense. You know, we were talking about this a lot this week behind the scenes, not necessarily on air, because I was writing it. I was putting together a piece on Travis's dad's race and the uh, the uh, the Southern Ontario sprints in general for Inside Track, and you know the thing that I kind of wanted to focus on was something I didn't really, I never really put together is, is the start money and how that affects things. And I remember Travis went and raced a couple of ESS races to start the year, and I was like, oh, like why would you make the track out there? And he's like, well, it pays like three hundred to start US. Whereas, you know, like that, that more than covers the trip, or at least helps me break even just to start and break even finish one of those things. Right. So, so that I think kind of has to be the focus. And I think more track promoters, series promoters need to talk to drivers like Megan, like Travis, just get together and, and, and brainstorm on, on how purses need to be dispersed better. It's great for headlines to have a 25,000 to win race or at 1500 uh or $15,000 to win to or race to win or whatever uh even the southern ontario sprints they have a couple shows that are going to be 4000 3000 all that's great but what would the car count look like if you could guarantee all 24 drivers were walking away with 350 canadian from each event or, or 500 or 500 right like so what if the winner only walks away with 1800 if that means you get a full field of 24, you're going to get a better car count, which hopefully in turn ends up with tracks happier, crowds bigger, more of a following, more of a regular turnout of, of drivers that you get to know that fans can attach themselves to. And then you can worry about having big races. Then you can worry about and having more than just one or two big nights on the schedule who knows maybe you even attract a bigger sponsor along the way maybe the success of a series or a uh, a track draws somebody in halfway through the year and all of a sudden this company with an extra ten thousand dollars to kick into your purse says you know what it'd be really good for us to celebrate our whatever anniversary of our company or whatever situation that we're in with a big money race at the end of the year how do you guys feel about an extra top up on your series and then all of a sudden then you've got your big money races right that's just me i mean it's really easy for me who's never put together a series never driven anything in his life to come out oh. and say that but that's just how I view things is I just feel like, you know, I think a little bit more collaboration between tracks, promoters, uh, drivers and teams right now about purse money could be more beneficial to the overall health of the motorsports uh, world. Another one good thing I want to say, but another I want to add is like I saw an interview this year with Tim McCready talking about all the big dirt late model money races like they've got so many $50,000 win races like there seems like there's one or two every week. But uh, even he was saying, because like most of them are like 50,000 to win, 2,000 for 10, 800, 700 to start, stuff like that. But he was saying if you just took all those $50,000 ones to win, make them 20,000. And if you could make it like 10 or like, uh, what do you say? 20,000 to win, like 5,000 to start, and like 7,500 for 10, 10,000 for 10, stuff like that. And then uh, you'd see a lot more cars, and then like a lot more guys can keep going because then pays for a lot of bills because like i always say pay it costs just as much for the guys at the back to race as it does the guys at the front exactly. you're absolutely right see I've, I've been trying to find people to counter argue argue me here because i i'm very much of the guy like there there was no excuse for a lot of people to show up today but to what you were just saying there jonathan with or and, and travis with cutting off from the top we actually did that with the cvms this year where instead of the winner walking home with, I don't, I don't I'm gonna be honest, I'm, I'm their freaking social media guy. I don't even know what the heck they were paying per night, but it was like, <laughs> but I know what they did this year is we changed up how our payouts go. Is that now instead of five hundred to win or six hundred to win each night, it was now, um, if you started both features, you were going home guaranteed with, I think, three hundred dollars or two fifty. Doesn't yeah. matter if you finish so first or deal. finish 10th. Only thing that night you're worrying about is your points. And then yep. at the end of the year, then obviously that's where the breakdown of, you know, 
for I don't know what again I don't even know what the heck we pay out at the end of the year for for, for winning the championship. But let's say it's fifteen hundred dollars to win, thousand dollars for second. That's where the breakdown comes into play. But to help the guys continue to come back week after week, we've now gone instead of a six six hundred to win, it's now two fifty or three hundred across the board. So that way it doesn't matter if you finish first or finish tenth, but you have to start both features to get that guaranteed money. Yeah. And I just think like I look at models of there's other sports that are going through the same thing right now, right? Like um, you know, I'm a big golf fan. You look at the whole whole PGA versus live thing and why players were drawn away from playing for the PGA tour. Well, and and you look at the PGA tour and there is tons of big money purses that are on the PGA, but if you finish, you know, T40, it, it, you know, you're finished 40th, you finish 37th, you might make $26,000 or, uh, you know, $40,000. And you might think, oh, $40,000 for four days of work. Like those guys are living the dream. You go and do that every couple of weeks. That's great. But that doesn't, factor in the fact those guys have to pay to fly themselves there to the tournament they have to pay a caddy they have to pay you know membership fees they have to some a lot of those guys aren't getting clubs for free you know and if they break something or they need a tune-up during the thing they're going to go to the pga trailer and they're going to have to pay for stuff there so all of a sudden forty thousand dollars in prize money turns into you know ten thousand dollars uh you know for a professional golfer to walk away meanwhile how much money did the pga just make off of them i don't think we necessarily have a problem in southern ontario where tracks no. and promoters and everyone, they're trying their best to rich. pay us yeah no exactly. one's getting rich like the pga like no that. no 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 nobody's getting nobody's that's not happening right here but the same principle applies why was the live was so attractive to guys because they were getting a guaranteed salary you could go and finish last or you could go and finish first but either way you're getting your couple million or whatever you signed with the the live golf tour to pay you right so i almost wonder if if a model like that works better at lower levels of racing i think that's kind of even how big levels of racing are are starting to work and we just don't know that like uh i remember connor daly was breaking it down on his podcast of he finished i think top five or just outside the top five in the indy 500 and you know when you look at the purse breakdown it's like oh that paid x amount of dollars but by the time tra- uh, by the time Connor paid off everything that was associated to pay, he only walked away with like a couple thousand dollars or something like that for a top ten finish in the Indy Five Hundred, the biggest wow. race in the world, right? right? So uh, you know, I would go and I would say go and rec- go and watch that episode to get the exact numbers. I don't want to speak to- too much out of turn, but I just remember it being really shocking that one of the largest racing series in the world, one of the largest races, period drivers aren't really making all that much to go in and, and place inside the top 10. Right. So I just think the system, the system can be tweaked, but I think it's going to take collaboration from all sides to figure out what is going to be the most, you know, um, successful and sustainable at the end of the day, way to make sure that uh, racers can keep showing up to the racetrack. I wonder if that's why we've seen what we've seen in, in from NASCAR where they've kind of, uh, blacklisted what all the what all the purses are, or what the breakdowns of the purses are. Because I remember reading in the they, newspaper yeah, exactly Sunday morning or, or Monday morning, there'd be your list of the top forty finishers or top forty three all forty three finishers, and it would break down who got who took home what from the purse. Yep. And it's yep. been, I think, five seven years ish, and they stopped doing that. So I made me wonder if maybe they've done that. You know what? Because right? well. sponsorship's gone down and money's gone down. <laughs> That yeah, because no one wants to see that they paid more in 1993 than they do now, or like, you know and, what I mean. That's a big reason of it. That and they have the charter system too, where at the end of the day, um, a team owner makes more money. Um, they actually factor in how much money you make per race based on your last three years' performance with that charter, rather than how you did that day. True. So, like that's why it's so important. Um, like when they got. Uh, when Kurt Busch got into the playoffs last year, but then couldn't race because of his injury and Bubba Wallace went into that car, it was to keep the owner's points high as possible so that it could, that charter could keep generating money. Had nothing to do with who was driving the car. It was about how the charter system works. And there's pros and cons to both because now in NASCAR, look at a charter is basically like having a sports franchise, right? Where, you know, if you want to race in NASCAR, you got to have a charter to get the most money out of it. And all of a sudden it's more valuable to hold on to a race team, right? 
Um, so it, it's just an interesting time in general for motorsports. And um, I don't think there's a one size fits all solution for every single series. I think um, there's going to be aspects that dirt racing world, the dirt racing world and local tracks can take from the pavement side of things. There's aspects pavement guys are going to be able to take away from other things. We all have different challenges facing each other. So I, I'm just, I'm very interested to see where it's going to go. And I personally, from my media standpoint, I'm committed to making sure that it doesn't just thrive, but survive at the end of the day. Mm. I I definitely agree. Like we want it. We want to see the, the sport really just grow like that. I think, I think that's what we're all really wanting is just for it to grow. And with what you guys are doing, I, again, I stumbled across it. You guys were at uh, Motorama, I believe, correct? Yeah. You guys, you guys did the live show. I walked mm-hmm. by. I I sat down for a few minutes and listened in, and you know, I I really enjoyed it. I think that's, I think that roundtable, um, opportunity for you guys. Like, I I didn't do it this year. I did it last year, but I didn't feel like put, trying to put a show together last minute and and get up on stage and and trying to see if Megan can come down for the show this year and. It was it was just too much to put in last minute, um, but I I really love the opportunity that you know uh, inside track and the, them are doing to really give us an opportunity to show people like hey, it's not just racing anymore. We do have programming here in Ontario that wants to show you the backside of this crazy world that we love, and I love the fact that we get to get it, we can go up there and do live shows. Uh, during Motorama because it it does bring it does bring that out and it gives a chance for you guys to to meet everyone as well. Yeah, definitely had fun at Motorama. I've always loved like I won best appearing dirt car at that show before when it was what what was it called before Motorama. It was called Performance World. I won yeah, it when it was Performance World. World still, but it's still the same thing. I love going there every March and uh, networking and doing all that stuff. And like you say, it's definitely. The way they get us to put a live show on, like we gained a couple viewers that day that had never listened to our stuff before and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, just the shows like that. And like you say, to just to promote the, because like I love the backdoor stuff that we watch. Like we just had Luke Carlton on the show and I hadn't watched one of his oldest dirt racing videos yet on YouTube. And because we just had him on the show, I have watched over half of them now because I binge watched them all (laughs) weekend and stuff like that. So yeah definitely getting it out on social media is the main thing. And, uh, cause yeah, it's tough if we don't do anything about it and keep promoting it and making sure it keeps prospering, like it's going to die. Cause lots of tracks closing and not lots, many open up. So that's the main thing there. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is that, uh, that, that publication, publicizing the stories, telling stories, right. That's the biggest thing for me is I love stories and I, I want to make sure that stories get told because, yeah, you know, a lot of these guys are local legends. You look at like Pete Bicknell, you know, I remember when I was in high school, I think, or maybe it was like first year of college or something. One of my friends ended up interning at, uh, at Bicknell Racing Products. And he was telling me about the fact that, you know, there's, there's this little shop in St. Catharines that has race parts that are getting shipped to Hendrick Motorsports. And that starts ringing bells for me because I'm more a NASCAR guy or at that point, I definitely was more a NASCAR fan and more familiar with that world. And I'm like, wait, you're telling me like one of the best NASCAR teams is buying parts or buying something from, uh, y- you know, this little shop in St. Catharines and then you go to the shop and you're like, oh, it's not such a little shop. Like it's a big deal. Like Bicknell racing chassis are dominating the Northeast right now for modifieds, uh, you know, uh, knock wood. We're trying to make sure we keep the uh, unbeaten streak alive this year on the super dirt car series. Uh, so, you know, now that I say that I'm probably announcer jinxing it, so I apologize. <laughs> we've, so we've talked about it enough on the show. I don't think it's not, it's my fault no. at this point if we, uh, <laughs> if that streak ends, but yeah, like the, we're really spoiled in Southern Ontario being race fans. And I think the more fans that we can bring in and the more fans of other racing series that we can get out to the racetrack and kind of tell you like, Hey, like this is a big deal. Like there, there's some connections to the professional top ranks of motorsports you may not even realize are in your own backyard right so travis mentions you know earl ross the only canadian that's ever won a cup series race drove for his dad's team like that that that's a piece of history of racing history that you know travis gets to tell a story about to people and 
you know, if you are a lifelong NASCAR fan, but you've never been to your local dirt track or your local pavement short track, you might not be aware of that story. And then all of a sudden you realize how much closer to the story you actually can be by meeting people like Travis, by meeting uh, a Pete Picknell in the garage, by going and talking to a Matt Williamson, by going and talking to a Carlton. Like there's so many, there's the racing rich racing history is so rich in Southern Ontario. It's just, it's fun to be a part of and to make sure to keep telling those stories. Yep. I think we should jump into the fan question period. Oh boy. I don't know if you All have right. those. Did you send them to me, John? Yeah, or they're on they're on our note. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. They have oh, show boy. notes and everything. No, uh, I was gonna say we have <laughs> we we have, we have a we have uh we have definitely uh a, a dedicated person on Instagram each week that doesn't matter who's our guest, he finds a question yeah. for us to ask during this. He is probably one of our biggest supporters of the fan question period. Um, but <laughs> Megan, he <laughs> he's huh? the Steve Zels- Zelznick, eh? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, he's tied off on ours though, a little bit. He's my best friend's dad. He's <laughs> our main guy on social media. Always. Yeah, he was commenting <laughs> on everything for a while there for Facebook. Yeah, and we appreciate it, by the way. Yes. Okay. So it's William underscore Trillium said, what is both of your favorite dirt tracks and why? Mm. Well, Travis, you've been to more, so you should, (laughs) you should pick. (laughs) Favorite dirt track. I'm biased and I have two. It's Merrittville and Osh Weekend. Just because Merrittville, it's because when I was a kid, all I ever wanted to do was be a stock car driver. Didn't want to do anything else. That's all I ever wanted to do. And Maryville Speedway is where that came true. I always thought it would come true at maybe Flamer or Mossport or Corth or something on pavement, but it didn't go that way. And Maryville Speedway was why. And then Oshweekin Speedway is just because it's just so fast. It was like the first like the first time I went there, I took my 358 Modified there one time just for some hot laps because we had a race coming up there and the track was heavy and stuff like that. And I remember on the way there, my dad was like, uh, you know, just take it easy the first few laps and feel it out and stuff like that. And first corner i was wide open and didn't lift the whole time and it was just the first wide open dirt track i got to race at so that was it and like i remember the first time my dad saw it we were doing uh, we were going to do mikey kretschka's sportsman motor and uh he was keep he was working for glenn at the time and he kept it up at the track and he just went up there and looked at it at the speedway and he was like man oh it's like dirt course i like it is i don't know what to tell you about it it's so awesome just because my and my dad always loved the bigger tracks like his car when he raced with Earl and Tom Walters back in the day, he raced at Delaware because it was a bigger track and like all his engines. A lot of the time, I always say like we never went to Cayuga to see our my dad's engines lose very often, and he was good at Mossport and Quarth and all those bigger tracks where his stuff really shined. And uh, so that's why I love Osh Weekend as well. And uh, those are the two tracks I've had the most laps at. So yeah, Merrittville and Osh Weekend. I mean, for me, it's pretty easy. I I, I kind of have to pick. Merrittville I mean like that is that's home uh in so many ways and it's the place that I got my start no matter what level of broadcasting I get to or don't get to I I know that I wouldn't be at this point in my career if I hadn't had the start that I had at Merrittville but beyond that it's it's Canada's oldest dirt track and the other thing is that it's it's kind of known throughout the northeast it's one of those places if you can win at Merrittville you can go and win anywhere it's known for being a tricky racetrack and a, a great proving ground for modified drivers and drivers of all classes, really. So I kind of like that I get to hang my hat that I work at that kind of racetrack and that uh, a, a racetrack like that has the, um, you know, has the hit, the fanfare and the the history to it. So uh, my pick is Maryville, but I'm, I'm, I could be swayed. We'll see. Okay. You never know. It... My best track I've been to, like, it's not the best track racing wise, but my favorite track I've ever been to to watch was Williams Grove just for the because when every time I've been there, it's been us uh, PA Posse versus Outlaws. It's always been an outlaw race when I was there. And just the atmosphere in that place is next level crazy when it's like that up on Beer Hill and stuff like that. So for that, it's a uh, Williams Grove is the best track I've been to to travel at just to watch. But I've never been to Eldora or Knoxville yet. So that could change by that point. Yeah. <laughs> Knoxville uh, for sure. Oh yeah. 
Well, guys, that's going to wrap up our fan question period. Of course, we want to thank William for uh, submitting that question as he does. It, uh, and he, uh, man, William, thank you so much for you're, you're always a uh, he's a, he's our hero each week. Even if we get one question, yeah. guaranteed it's from him. And so we thank you for that. And of course, we got to thank Taylor to you, Media and Designs, for uh, sponsoring that segment of the show each and every week. So if you guys are looking for one of your Joe Media tumblers, make sure you hit her up. Uh, this week she was actually at Sunset Speedway, which is awesome. She was a uh, and uh, the announcer at uh, Brandon Doherty, who announces that Sunset Speedway picked up a Dan Price tumbler. So nice. That's awesome. Cowboy. Oh yeah. Uh, she carries on, uh, she carries, uh, tumblers for Dan Price, myself, and, uh, for Brandon Feeney as well. So if you guys are ever in the area, find her on fa- social media and, uh, yeah, uh, make sure. So, yeah. Um, well guys, it's been, it's been a f- lot of fun. We've had a lot of fun with you guys over the past hour chatting with you guys. We definitely, I want to do this again. Cause these are always so much fun when we get to talk to other guys who, talk about racing who have a passion for racing so as as always we always do have an open door policy that if you guys would ever like to come back on you you guys already have an invitation so um but we're gonna we're gonna let you guys get going here in just a couple minutes but before we do you we have uh you guys are allowed to thank everyone and anyone who's helped you in your entire racing career from a pet you've had when you were a newborn that you didn't know about all the way up to uh your great great grandma who you never got a chance to meet. So Ooh. That's okay. I'll go first on that one. <laughs> yeah, you go first. You go first. I gotta think of some names here. So number one, it's my mom and dad, Gary Cunningham and Rose Cunningham. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have a racing career. They bought me my first go-kart. My dad taught me everything there is about racing. And uh yeah, just being Gary Cunningham's son was so cool growing up. And uh I just love living on the Canadian racing name. And then after that, it's Billy Evans. He's my dad's best friend, uh, right-hand man. Uh, and his son, Pee Wee Evans, had a real good racing career as well. But like one year in two, uh, 1999, Pee Wee had a real good year in his late model. Like he uh, finished second a bunch of times. He didn't win any of the super late model races, but he finished second a bunch. And that was a really good paying uh, series. They ended up getting like $3,000 just for finishing second in it. I forget what it was called, like the MVP Super Late Model Series. But back then, he did it just with like his late model. He would put a super late model engine in it. So he would race like a template bodied late model with stock or like one piston calipers against a super late model. So that was pretty cool. And uh, so, yeah, Billy Evans is number one. They bought me a go-kart, like I say, when they had that really good year. And uh, he helps me out now on the sprint car. And just traveling around with them in my childhood, working on their cars is what basically molded me as a racer. And uh, my go-karts always looked like the number 90, just like his uh, race car, his late model and stuff, red number 90. And then after that, after the Evans family, uh, they also helped buy my first dirt modified. And me and Pee Wee split it for the first season. So if it wasn't for that, like my stock car career wouldn't happen. So Evans family, definitely the goat on Cunningham racing engines or Cunningham family in racing. But after that, like Eric McNeven, I got to give him a shout out because that was my first ride ever in a sprint car when I drove the number 71. And uh, yeah, my three, only three wins in a stock car or a big car or running with Eric at Oshweek and Speedway. And they all came in the same month. Talk about getting hot. But uh, yeah, I got to get hot like that again soon. But yeah, Eric McNeven, that was a big one. Picking up that ride and being able to start my sprint car career, which has led to where we're at today. And uh, Bicknell Racing Products has always been there in my career. Uh, right now I've got, oh, John Brush, Tammy 10 Media. He's also Corpac Merchandising. He's been a big help out. When I've gotten my own car these last few years, so I got to thank John big time, and uh, I'll be seeing him coming up here at the big races at Ash Weekend. He's always there walking around. He's just such a big deal in racing. Like he sponsors so much stuff. He sponsors the Merrittville 358 class with Core Pack. He sponsors Super Modifieds. He sponsors Oswego. He sponsors dirt flat track bike people. So many people. So if it wasn't for John, uh, definitely wouldn't be as far in my racing career as it is either. And then to this year, I've got Performance Auto on my car and uh, Petruzzi Auto and Industrial Equipment. Who else? We're running out. Got picked now. Yeah. Those are the main ones for me. Yeah, I think um, I got to start with uh, obviously my mom and dad for uh, my dad for sitting me down in front of a TV and not changing the channel away from NASCAR long enough for me to get into it. Um, that's really where it all started. Um, 
my parents for getting me into go-karting, for taking me to NASCAR races to really like fuel the passion for it. Um, I need to thank my uh, amazing fiance, Kyra. She is a constant supporter. And every time I come to her with a crazy dream about starting a podcast or working at a racetrack or whatever else, she's the first person to support me. So I appreciate her for doing that. Uh, we're going to get a little name droppy here. So pardon this, but uh, I got to thank uh, Mike Neighbors who brought me into TSN uh, 1150. Jim Taddy for being so awesome and allowing me to work on his radio show, which is where I met Perry Lefko. Perry introduces me to Ron Fellows, uh, and then Ron Fellows pushes me to go to my local dirt track. So thank you to all of them. Uh, thanks to Tom Beals and uh, Don and Lorraine Spees for bringing me on board. Thank you to Stephen Petty for bringing me along as an announcer. I definitely don't know where I'd be without working alongside Steve for that first year and kind of getting the ropes shown to me that way. Um, thank you to Eric Thomas for all his support and advice. I mean, the guy's an absolute living legend and uh, uh, somebody that I, I very much have a lot of respect and time for. Thanks to Travis for doing this show with me and keeping me involved and the amount of stuff that I get to learn from having him uh, you know, uh, along for the journey and along for the ride in my, my own career has been, uh, I, I can't even count the amount of stuff that I've learned from, you know, talking to Travis and learning about stuff. Um, thanks to all the drivers at Maryville, everybody who's been on the Southern Ontario Dirt Show podcast for being so cool and uh, so understanding and helping me learn because I think that was the most, that was the hardest part of starting this deal is that I didn't come into this with all this knowledge and history of the racetrack. You know, I knew a couple of the big names. I knew some of the drivers, but I was really, really green to the sport of dirt racing, especially in Southern Ontario. And uh, everybody has been so, so cool to me. And uh, it's definitely allowed me to get over my imposter syndrome and feel like I actually uh, belong in the dirt world and I'm a part of the family. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to tell the stories. Thanks to Jeff and Rhonda Riley from Pet Value. They're big supporters across a lot of things that I do. Uh, shout out to Oshweden Speedway for sponsoring the show and big mill racing products i think that's everybody i should yeah. cover and my, and my dog finnegan because he's the best and my cats <laughs> Bowie, rosie and tiki yeah that was great i also want to say uh it's an honor to follow jeremy barton as a guest on the show just because <laughs> i always like busting on him and uh my our family and his family and it goes way back because like we out like anytime the barton motorsports uh tour mod was on the track at lancaster on the roc tour it was with a cunningham racing engine so super cool to follow jeremy uh so before you guys go of course we i know when the show drops and, and when it airs for anyone who's listening to this show who may not know about your show where can they find the southern ontario Dirt show and where can they find you on social media uh, so they can find the show at sods underscore pod at underscore sods pod uh or sods underscore pod, I should say. Um, you can find that on TikTok. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, the podcast drops usually on Fridays around noon, as long as I'm not celebrating my birthday like this week and uh, <laughs> out golfing. So I kind of had to be a little bit late with this week's show. But uh, yeah, and uh, coming soon to YouTube. I don't think we're going to do full video podcasts. I think it's going to be mostly just, you know, probably some images, some still frames set to the audio. Uh, for now, but uh, I know that it's a really accessible uh, place to put a podcast, so it will at some point get to YouTube whenever I get a chance to sit and backlog stuff. That's probably going to be this. At this point, it almost feels like it's an off-season project. <laughs> it's always so crazy. Yeah, we've been talking about that for a while. It, yeah, is the, gonna... is there really an off-season though? No, not anymore. <laughs> not even close. Especially when you own a race car and build your own engines, because it's almost more work in the off-season. <laughs> And both me, of us are working anyways. at and both of us are working at Bicknell Racing Products, which a minute the racing yeah. season's done. At least I it, haven't experienced this yet, but everybody tells oh, me you the, will. Minute, <laughs> the minute it's uh the racing season ends is when things get busy in the shop. So I'm sure I'm gonna uh, yeah. uh, feel it firsthand here what, that there's no such thing as an off season. But either way, we'll uh we'll see what comes down the line for the show. But we're just gonna keep rolling out and make sure they get out every week. That, yep. that's what i've no said problem. the that's why i said the past year couple of years here is my fiance hasn't really understood exactly what everything i do so as soon as the racing racing season is done i'm already starting to work on the next season and she goes why do you have to do that for i'm like because if i'm not prepared before that for, before uh motorama everything i've done in the off season doesn't mean anything because i have yeah. i have my time 
Go ahead. I was going to say, we're already getting our our, our uh, BRP uh, iRacing League, the, the eSports League that I had the chance to call last year. That's already getting planned out. So, I, I mean, I've got uh, involvement in that production company and putting on those iRaces. So uh, it's going to be a busy off season that doesn't really feel like an off season. But either way, I'm I'm looking forward to just getting back to a racetrack whenever I can. We should work with Jomo and put on a i racing daytona 500 and then maybe you'll get your to live out your dream call a daytona 500 now you're talking i like this now we, do, we got to do like classic cars though right we're not doing like the current cup right? no we, no we gotta no, no. you gotta do like old a, cars no yeah we, like, we can do the 87s yeah the 87s for go. sure those those things are awesome yeah deal there you go well, right, well let's stay in touch and let's figure out how we can make this dream a reality yeah, because yeah. I'm in. Whenever you want to talk. Well, Whenever I think you want to talk. I just added you as a friend today on Facebook, so we'll uh we'll connect and we'll we'll figure this out. Yeah, for yep. sure. Uh, looking forward to it. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us this week on the True North Racing Podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you guys, and I hope to see you guys soon at a racetrack because I will be coming down to Merrittville because I was supposed to go last night, but uh, changes cha- uh, plans change, and of course I got to get over to the pit side. So Travis, whenever you're there, I'll definitely come stop by and uh say hi to you guys and you guys have stickers correct mm-hmm. we actually well travis i think still has There's a couple left at, yeah. if, if i'm, I'm there, there and so you have I some have to... yeah are you coming to the pinty show at us weekend i'm or no? coming to the pinty show but i'm not going pit come side. See... Ooh, okay well i'll just just text <laughs> me that day message me on facebook and i'll wheel over to the grandstand side for you all right sounds good yeah you know, what can happen we'll hook you guys up perfect yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us this week and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night and we'll talk to you guys later. Cheers. Zach. Thanks, John. Thanks, Megan. Yes. And we're back from our fun conversation with uh, Travis Cunningham and Jonathan Howe of uh, the Southern Ontario Dirt Show. It's kind of fun. We didn't get a touch base on a lot of things because we, the conversations mm. just rolled really well. They did. And <laughs> of course, we were just we were just talking off uh, uh, just at, just before we let them go, uh, out of out of the Zoom call here, we were having this conversation, and the drivers were on one half of my screen not talking, and then me and Jonathan <laughs> Howe, I guess who are both the uh, producers of our shows, were on one side trying to talk about <laughs> different things. The drivers just okay. <laughs> I just want to turn left and go fast. <laughs> Literally, it's uh, funny how they're like similar to us that way. I was thinking the same thing. It was kind of funny. Like I noticed that approach with them was that they reminded me of a lot of us. Yeah. Because well, one, his name's Jonathan. Yeah. And he's kind of living out my dream by doing Merrittville. Yeah. But would they also have a driver to give that background information to, to get us to learn. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the same thing on our side is that I'm, I'm the guy over here who's never been behind the wheel of a stock car. Besides for freaking, you know, for uh, um, meet the driver's night, and you're over here is like, I want a feature. <laughs> you see this? <laughs> <laughs> you see that? That's my trophy. <laughs> I'm number one. <laughs> one time. <laughs> but still, you're able to when you're out there week after week. Yeah, you're able to. You know, you're able to explain this stuff. It's It's not. I don't always have like the best explanations. I can't say that like my thoughts are like the word of God because like like, I'm still learning. Yep. But like it's it's I guess just my opinion as like a rookie driver. I'd still consider myself a rookie. I mean, you've only had four starts, so I mean, you you would be considered a rookie still. Like it's. There wasn't mm-hmm. enough races for yourself to really be out there to to compete. But I think even still is that because of how the 2021 season played out, because your car number did run each week, you're not, unfortunately, not available to run for rookie yeah. of the year anymore. But, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but we, it is, it, it was really, it, it's so cool how similar, similar their shows are, but have, have you, have you listened, had a chance to listen to their show yet? Not a lot, to be honest. So I I'm was definitely gonna listen to it more now. I was gonna say because it when you when you listen to it, 
the intro right off the hop gets me hooked onto the show. Mm-hmm. The fact, you know, when they announce like, oh, it's episode like 61 or whatever it is that week. It's so cool how I really do enjoy that whole number thing they do where they figure out who's who's driven that number and they talk about it a little bit, which is it 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 brings me in to want to watch it. It does. And it also kind of gives shout outs for who might not get that opportunity. Like they might be somebody that doesn't run up front all the time. They don't get that media coverage. So it's just that little extra, like, I don't mean personally, if I were to hear that and someone was like, oh, 73, that's Megan Mitchell. I'd be like, oh, wow. <laughs> they know they me. Thought of, they know me. That They thought of me. Like, it'd be, it's cool. It's a really cool idea. And I like it. Uh, I, I'm i not saying we're ever going to bring that to our show. Yeah. Because we would just forget it half the time. And of course, we're, re- we're in the triple digits. Yeah. So, like, are we going to regurgitate the stuff every 100 episodes? Yeah. Um, but, no, it was it's, it was great having them on. It's going to be a lot of fun to see what comes of. Uh, you know, I'm really hoping to get a Southern Ontario Dirt Show uh, sticker here. Because mm-hmm. I do want to, I, I want to show that, like, the, first of all, I love the design of their stickers. It looks amazing. Mm-hmm. But I love the fact that they're. They were like I said, they remind me a lot of us. Yeah. At the same time, and and you know, they they put on a great show, they put on a great product. And I really enjoy I really enjoy watching them and, and racing, especially with Travis racing. Um mm-hmm. but it was so crazy how this past week alone, Jonathan has been popping up on my Facebook or on TikTok a lot more. Pop and I was like, Oh yeah, knows. like TikTok doesn't know me. <laughs> right. But they they know your schedule. They know what's going on. Apparently, they know they know my schedule the better than I do because I forgot that they were coming on at one point this week. That's crazy. But, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. But uh, we're gonna wrap up the show here. But before we do, we do have to give a big nod out to your sister Rachel Mitchell because I'm wearing our newly designed Joe Media T shirts. I have yours. Yours is in a bag over here, and it's. Mm-hmm. I'm currently wearing the driver's one, and I, that's the one I currently have for you. Your TNRP one is coming in. Do not worry. Okay. Um, <laughs> and we. I got a couple more goodies coming for you though too. So I got to talk to a couple people to to get those goodies in here. But um, we got a couple more things coming. Uh, yeah, your shirt's just sitting up over here. I really right. hope I got the right size. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> because <laughs> i think i went back through our messages back when you won the first show me a t-shirt and i'm like i nothing's think that's changed. it that, yeah nothing's changed it probably um, could but i don't <laughs> uh but yeah so i got your driver's t-shirt so that way you can you can wrap it whenever you want and i just need to remember to bring it next time <laughs> i see you because so you would have had it last week <laughs> if i remember to bring it it's okay uh no we got we got a nice i don't know when they're coming yet i'm hoping soon hoping soon because i would like i would like i would like the other shirts to get out to the public as well but if you guys are looking for your own joe media t-shirt you guys can dm us we are gonna put in another order whenever we get enough you know whenever people if you want to order a t-shirt let me know we got the joe media driver t-shirt is the one i'm currently wearing it has this awesome i can't really it's got our it's got our logo nice and big on the front, which I love, and then on the back side it has all the names of the twenty two drivers we are currently working with this year. Now, of course, there's a couple names missed out because they were been added after the fact. So that is also why you guys get onto Joe Media and Promotions team early because then you guys can get onto the T shirt earlier. See, um. But no, it's a so we got a supporters t shirt which has all the supporters that uh, Joe Media and Promotions works with. So we got graphic designs, we got um, oh boy, <laughs> you can tell I don't do this very often. Was it like Vision 20 Studios? Vision, we got Vision 20 Studios who presents the podcast, we got Taylor to you, Media and Designs who brings to you our fan question period each week. We also have wilds printing who does our who is the sponsor for our weekly driver lineup we got georgetown printing who does our weekly breakdown 
We have uh, graphic design who does a lot of our design work. I I I'm th- so thankful for her because I know I couldn't be able to do it. Um, <laughs> damn it! Now I'm gonna bring up JoeMedia.ca. <laughs> See, look at that, guys! I even plugged the website for y'all. Forgetting Jacqueline's mom. Jacqueline She's Andrea. Isn't Lift the Visor on there? Lift the Visor. You're looking at it, aren't you, you cheater? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I just remember seeing the shirt we, and like we got Claude Haggerty, the sponsor man, on here. Uh yeah, we got a lot of great people here. Graphing designs, driver cow, lift the visor, vision 20 studios, tailored to you. Claude Haggerty sponsor Superman. Uh, we also did work with the Ignite Racing League uh and Georgetown Printing, but I gotta give them one more plug because they were they agreed to work with. They ran our iRacing series over the off season. We did the media for it, but they held the races for us. Um, and then of course we got our True North Racing podcast stickers. Uh, true no. True North Racing podcast T shirts, which I think are the probably the coolest shirt we have now, which because one? it's got the True North Racing podcast ones. Oh yeah, because I got that gray like chess logo. And then on the back, it makes it look like you're listening to it on Spotify. Yeah. I love it cool. each and every week. It is it is awesome. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys would like a T-shirt, please message me, and we will get one ordered in for you. And then that way, next time we see you guys at a racetrack, we will have them for you. Um, I feel like there's something else I was going to talk about briefly before we, before we uh, end of the show, but now I'm blanking on it. I don't know. If it comes back to me, maybe we'll maybe we'll see it next week on the show. I don't know. Actually, next week we're taking the week off. We are taking the week off, but let's find out why. Megan, where will you be next week? Next week. I should be racing next week. Fingers crossed. If not, I will be at Flamborough either way, crewing for my brother and sister. And this week, I will be heading up to Sawell Speedway for their Dash for Cash race on Wednesday. Uh, Jacqueline and I are heading up Tuesday night, which by the time you guys listen to this podcast, we'll probably already be up there. So actually, yeah. maybe not because she has an appointment at noon. Mm-hmm. So if you guys listen to it, maybe after five o'clock that night, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> but if you guys are listening after five o'clock at night now, that's just, yeah, let's not get into that. because I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. I don't want to go down. Um, but no, like it's uh, yeah, we got a we're going to go up for Sobble's uh, Dash for Cash Friday night. I'm excited for that one. We get to go see the comedian Matt Reif down oh, at yeah. uh, huh? His videos have been popping up on my for you page on TikTok so much lately. He's yeah. he's hysterical. Yes, I've I've watched like all three of his specials numerous times on uh, uh, on YouTube because mm-hmm. he has three specials and I and he also did um, it's called the Overnight Channel, which was actually investigating like paranormal activity houses. Oh yeah, oh no no, you need to. Ch- I'll I'm gonna find a couple good ones. I'm gonna send them to you. I need to see that how he reacts in these places huh. like he's he's a great comedian but when he's on these things he is the scaredest one <laughs> he is oh my god if you like i'll find a good couple ones i'm gonna get i'll tell i'll tell jacqueline to s- tell me a couple good ones for to send to you but they're okay. all on youtube give him a watch um yeah, there's there. I love it because the one day she was watching, I just looked over and I'm like, Is that Matt Reif? Hmm? And she goes, Who? I'm like, That white boy right there, the pretty one. I'm like, that white boy. I'm like, That's Matt Reif. She goes, How do you know him? I was like, He was on Wild and Out at one point, and you know, I thought he's a funny dude and didn't think anything of him. At like, I thought he would have been just like a Wild and Out kind of guy. I didn't know he was a stand up comedian, I didn't know nothing like that until yeah. I was, until you know. All of a sudden, overnight came out. And I see him coming up on TikTok, and I was a stand-up comedian because I was like, "Oh, he got kicked off a while now. I guess he's trying to stand up stand-up comedy." And just, I didn't realize how long he's actually been doing it for. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, so we're gonna see that on Friday night, and then I don't think we're gonna hit up any more racetracks next weekend because we're hope I'm hoping to have the boys next weekend. 
Mav came down with strep throat last week, so we didn't take him this weekend. Oh, yeah. Which is why we asked if you guys wanted to go. I know it was last minute to go on a so ghost bad. walk. Oh, we like I told you earlier, we didn't even get a chance. We didn't even make it in time. Like we would have made it in time, <laughs> but we would not have got to watch the sunset. So yeah, and I mean I got a beauty of a panorama shot hmm. of uh, it's like let me see here. Yeah, there it is. Oh, that is nice. There it is. I like that. Like right? That. Mm-hmm. And of course, Brandon Feeney sends me an attachment as we're on the show. <laughs> as if he doesn't think we're that. recording. Way to ruin it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I don't think we're going to hit up any racetracks next weekend. Uh... Then the following weekend, I don't think I will either. Jacqueline is running a 5K that weekend. So I think the next oh, yeah. time I'm, I think the next weekend I'm out at a racetrack will be the NASCAR Pinties race on August hmm. 13th, 15th. Right. Which someone didn't message me about who was coming. I forgot. And then Cody said something <laughs> about it. And I'm like, oh my God, John asked me that. Like, Two or three yeah. weeks ago. Shoot. <laughs> I you don't know, know what... if I'll be able to go. Okay? Oh. But you know what's right? funny? Is my that whole interaction I had with Cody about it. Because mm-hmm. I shot him a message. It was like, hey, do you want to go to the uh where is it here? I know it's not too too far back. He goes, uh, I'm like, hey, you going to the NASCAR dirt race? He goes, we're in the States. I wish. I'm like, dude, it's Oshwegan. <laughs> he goes, I'm like, I thought we were going to go to the Monday night. And I'm. he goes, what? I'm like, don't tell me you didn't know. And he, yeah, I didn't say. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that. We'll see how. Uh, I know we're going to go. We're going to take uh, Amy with us. So. If anyone catches me in the grandstands, please act like you don't know me. I'm just kidding. Feel <laughs> if you guys see me at uh at Oshigan Speedway, please feel free to come up and say hi. Um it I still say those it's weird when that when that happens. Yeah. When we get people walking up and go, Hey, I listen to your podcast, man. It's so good. I'm like, I don't know how to re- I don't know how to react. Right. Like, how do you react? Like, how, like, wh- like wh- when someone says, "I listen to the podcast," I love it. What, what, what have they said to you? They've never said anything to me about the podcast, but I've had people recognize me through Lift the Visor, and then like a- after my feature win, people would be like, "Oh, hey, great job this or last weekend or whatever weekend. Like, good luck this weekend." They're calling by me by name and everything, and I'm like. Mm-hmm thanks i have no idea who you are right now and like it just it freaks me out but i mean that's coming from the same person who worked at the lcbo had a literal name tag on and people call me my name and i'm like how do you know my name <laughs> oh. right I, i'm in a you know it's obvious <laughs> it's yeah. right there no i, I it, it is a cool feeling but i never know how to it, react to when someone says i love, no. I love the show it's like my 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 question is how do you know about the show right. <laughs> then i'm like oh right so yeah the next time i'll be at the racetrack will be besides wednesday will be ash um mm-hmm. so you guys will will have we'll have a show before then no we won't will we yes we will when is it Oshwegan is the 14th and 15th. So, yes, we do, because we, we will have Kyle yeah. Lucas. Kyle Lucas. So, actually, I'm going to do a little bit of breaking news because it's going to be announced to, on Monday morning. So, this is Tuesday when it drops. Uh, Kyle Lucas is doing a raffle on his uh, pure stock. It'll be $50 a spot at $100. Sorry, $50 a spot for 100 spots. Yeah. So. When you guys listen to this, head on over to my over to uh, my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, if you guys find it, and you guys can put your name in for the draw. Uh, 
we are going to have all the spots spoken for before we start collecting money. So that way there's no issues if it doesn't sell within the first uh, week or two. So if you guys want a, a, a highly contested front running peer stock, here's your opportunity. It's $50 a spot. We have a hundred spots. You have a one in a hundred chance to win. Not a bad odd. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, it's, it's terrible odd, but it's still a long shot, but <laughs> still a long shot regardless, but you never know who's going to like, happen. Yeah. And it's a chance. Like, I, I mean, look at Scott Tinelli with his CVM. He literally bought a single ticket and the guy races CVMs full time now because he won it. Like that could be your entryway into a peer stock. Exactly. Just 50 bucks. Exactly. So make sure you guys, uh, Find me on social media if you guys are looking for a, a highly contested pure stock at Flamborough Speedway. And uh, let's get you behind the wheel of a brand new or a race winning race car. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't think there's too much else we needed to talk about tonight. If not, we can always wait uh, until the next show. And again, if it's more for us, then we can talk later. So, yeah. Uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for listening to True North Racing Podcast brought to you by Vision 20 Studios. Make sure you guys follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, as well as find everything going on at joemedia.ca. You guys can also find my my schedule on my race schedule, not yet, but you guys can find mm -hmm. my schedule um, of what track I'll be at when. I got to update that, actually. I just realized that I'm probably a little bit, I'm not too far behind, but a little bit behind. Um, I like me like putting out a schedule so that people know where I'm going to be. So if they want to see me, they they know. Oh, I'm. Um, but yeah. Make sure you guys check out all the drivers' information there. You guys can uh, catch profiles from all 22 drivers that we have over there on the website. Uh, you guys can also catch the True North Racing podcast. Uh, we're gonna add a new segment actually to the to the website. I gotta talk with uh one of our good friends, Mister Brandon Feeney, about it. But I think we're gonna add the Feeny call to its own tab. Um, either that, or what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change uh, the True North Racing Podcast tab to the podcast. And what we'll do is we'll have the True North Racing Podcast and the Feeny call both available right there on hmm. uh, two segments of the page. Because I I want to see Feeny grow his podcast, so I'm I'm thinking that might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to reach out to Feeney after this so he can't say anything when he listens to the podcast mm -hmm. um, but yeah thank you guys for listening this week we hope you guys enjoy the next week off away from us because with, it is a long weekend so we usually don't like doing uh, it's personal preference for me not doing shows on, on long weekends because usually I have my boys for and this is their room that I record in so I don't really yeah. It's 10, 14 p.m. I don't think they want me in here with all the lights on and <laughs> talking for two. Can't go to sleep yet. Sorry? I said you guys can't go to sleep yet. Yeah, you guys can't go to sleep yet, but <laughs> but yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening. For Megan Mitchell, I'm John Morrison, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Bye now. See you guys. The car zooming by. Hey, true north racing. Let's go.